Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome to another day of fabulous live streaming here on Adobe Live on Behance.net. Great to see everyone out here. Hopefully, hopefully you were with us yesterday because we'll be continuing on with our journey getting you started in After Effects. I'm Evan Abrams, a motion designer and visual effects artist based out of fabulous Ottawa, Ontario, and uh, I'm here to here to help get you into this program that I love so much that I use, I want to say, almost every day. And uh, hopefully I can get you comfortable with uh, motion design, motion graphics, compositing. It's going to be great. Uh, but today, just like yesterday, this is, this is a stream for the beginners out there. So, you know, if you get lost, if you're ever... Uh, kind of confused with what's going on, please let me know in the chat and I want to uh, I want to help you out as best I can. And of course, if you're joining us here, I would love to know, love to know who you are, where you're from, and what you're doing in After Effects or what you want to do in it. Uh, because, you know, we all, we all have dreams about what we'd like to accomplish, so I'd like to know what you'd like to be doing with this program. Um, this is just the start of a great day here on the Adobe live streams. Uh, we have a lot of great things going on out here. A lot of great things will be happening. Let's just take a little dip into the schedule here as we start our day. Uh, we've got, of course, I'm up now, getting you started in After Effects. Of course, then we have coming up right after this at nine o'clock uh, Pacific time, we've got a Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge with uh, Jesus Ramirez. Uh, then we have some illustration. Uh, so illustration with branding is coming up after that. Some very excellent uh, branded stuff. And then we've got uh, uh, Daily Creative Challenge uh, in Illustrator after that, followed with some UI, UX, and design systems. Love a good design system. Design systems not just for UI and UX, uh, but for everything, I believe. But we, we find it from the UI, UX, and Rachel Smith does a great job uh, with that stuff. And then your XD Daily Creative Challenge. Uh, and finally... Uh, wind out, wind down your day, drawn along with Kathleen. Uh, you might know on the internet as Kathleen Illustrated. So, thank you so much for 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 coming out, for for spending time here with me, spending time with all of us, uh, and definitely stick around because uh, you will not you will not want to miss uh, the day of illustration coming up after. So, let's get back to what we're doing today. What are, what are we working on um, today? We are going to be continuing on from yesterday where we talked about 3D layers in After Effects. And specifically, we talked about inserting our motion design into a scene. I know it was a big, big day talking about uh, talking about data and tracking points and uh, all these all these little little nerd note things that I love so much. Um, we're going to recap just briefly what we did yesterday and build on it today to make our, make our use of 3D layers in After Effects just a little bit more, um, a little bit more integrated, a little bit more natural looking, perhaps, and, uh, we'll go from there. So, like I said, uh, if you are, if you're watching this, if you're hanging out with me here in the chat, please ask questions. Stop me if you get confused. I'm here to help. And if you are, if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, come join us on behance.net slash live. That's where I can read your, read your comments, read your questions, and uh, try to help you out as best I can. Come join in the fun. It's always a good time on Behance. So let's have a look at the screen and uh, see what we're going to do. So I adjust my glasses. So yesterday we went ahead and we added Oh, I've already spoiled the reveal. Oh boy, I'm really nailing it today, folks. But yesterday we went through and we added this text callout into the space. Okay, that's what we that's what we were we were making happen, and there was a bit of a process to that, right? We had to, of course, import our footage normally. That's where we want to put the things, and then uh, we went ahead and we we solved our scene. We solved it. We would say that we have created, we've, we've helped After Effects understand the scene so that we could put a 3D camera into the space that mimics the motion of the real camera in the space, the real helicopter or probably drone in this case, uh, as it flew over the mountains. And all of that works with the 3D camera tracker placing points out in the world so that After Effects can understand the scene, understand roughly the geometry by picking out little points where things are different. Right? 
And then using the power of computers, <laughs> we were able to generate a camera. So we put stuck a camera out in the scene and After Effects was able to determine all of these things that it knows about the camera based off the data that we fed it, that it took from this footage. And then we were able to find points and planes and spaces in the scene. So we went in here, we created a null object up here, a null layer, which just holds data, holds space, spatial data. And then we could parent our little graphic here to that point, and it appears to live in the space. Now, all of this worked because, because things are going on top of stuff. But if we wanted to insert something, say behind this mountain, that's a little bit more difficult. So today, today we are going to uh, get into that next level of difficulty. And uh, hopefully we've got a lot of people joining us uh, who are hanging out with day one. I'm already seeing a lot of good good folks in here. I'm um, seeing Sean, <laughs> thanks for coming back. Michelle is here. Umacord, great to see you uh, in the chat as always. Moderator Tim holding it down on the boards. And uh, oh, Ian, Ian is back for part two, loving it. It's so good. <laughs> And we will, we will of course, um, we will see uh, if we can, uh, if we can, we can guide you through things. And of course, if there was anything from yesterday um, that was that was uh, confusing or or uh, unpleasant, <laughs> then we'll try to we'll try to get you through there as well. So, like I said, what are we doing today? Well, I want to put things behind. Uh, layers. I want to put things behind this mountain. Um, so how do we put this, this fella back there? And he looks like, he looks like he lives there. <laughs> so this, this fun Yeti is hanging out back there. Boop, boop. Hello. C good to see a Yeti friend. <laughs> do you have some news for me? Um, so how are we going to make it so that this guy appears to live here? That's the big question for today. And there are many, many techniques that we can get into. Uh, there are a lot of problem solving that we have to do. So often when we think about creativity um, and we think about um, what kind of art we're going to be creating, uh, you know, problem solving uh, doesn't always factor into it. But when it comes to this kind of compositing work, this kind of integration we are just solving a series of problems and we need to leverage various tools in order to do that. So I'm gonna be talking you through a few techniques. I'm gonna be talking you through um, a few approaches that you might have uh, in order to solve these problems. And uh, we will try to, we'll try to make it work. Um, so to start with though, uh, we need to have something to put into the space. Now, I've already gone ahead and, and put this wonderful Yeti in here. So I don't know, any any suggestions at all? We could just drop some text in here. We could, um, let's see, we could put another call out perhaps, or maybe an arrow, um, nothing too fancy. This is, this is, a, this is a beginner thing, um, but maybe I'll get started with um, showing you what the problem is with putting the Yeti into the space. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and sort of undo uh, all of my hard, hard work here. <laughs> I will start with that. Okay, so this Yeti layer, this this funny looking Yeti, hello, he's like a, it's like a weird bean uh, with some horns. This is all just made in a little, little square composition, right? And this line here is, is for my own uh, purposes of understanding, you know, what, what line do I want him to, to come up past? And he's just, he's just bouncing up in his own little world. And yesterday we talked about how 3D layers in After Effects are all just, um, they're all just like panes of glass out there that we've put into the world. So this pane of glass happens to have, um, just happens to have uh, a Yeti animating on it, right? So whoop, he's doing this. And we've put him out there in the space. We've placed him 
out in the world in the same way that we have put uh, this uh, this uh, this call out out in the world right he just lives out there in 3d space and i've pushed him back i've pushed him back far enough that it feels like he lives just beyond that cliff there he just he's just hanging out just beyond the cliff there but then we need to cover him up we need to cover up some of his body because we don't want to see this much of his body okay so we need to make that uh, that part of his body go away. We need to cover it somehow. So we're going to investigate some techniques we could use to cover up uh, all of these, um, all of these sort of um, parts that should not be seen. So this is a little bit of a conceptual um, leap, I suppose, uh, that what we need to do is to think about removing from this layer, to cover from this layer, to make it appear as if it is behind something. So that's the that's the magic trick, right? That it doesn't really live behind the mountain. We're just removing enough of it so it feels like it lives behind the mountain. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's that fits uh, with, with what we need. So in order to do that though, what we need to do is to somehow capture this shape here, this, this line that makes up this edge of the mountain. Now, we're using this kind of foreground element here, uh, mostly because it's very prominent, right? But depending on where your object is going to go is going to depend on the techniques, depending on what you're going to do. And Michelle is asking in the chat, is it like masking in Photoshop? Absolutely, yes. That is a great way to think about it. Um, and just like masking in Photoshop, we have various uh, techniques and options available to us. We have, we have many, many tools that we might use, okay? And the way I've done it for this Yeti example, which we will build towards, we will build here. Um, you could, I have created this little pre-comp here that doesn't look very good at all. This looks like a piece of garbage. What? Why would I show you such garbage? Um, well, garbage is exactly what this is. So this is a, a garbage mat here and then a more specific mat here to make the edge very precise and then just to cover up the rest of it. You know, that's kind of the idea. I just need to, I just need to cover up the visual space. That's all. So, I just, I just wanted to kind of show you where we're going before we start going there, okay? This is um, uh, an interesting interesting topic to try to tackle. So let's talk about some methods that we might use to make this shape, right? How would we capture this particular shape and make sure that as that shape changes, over time, it's easy for us to make something conform to that shape. Well, the first thing uh, to talk about, uh, it's, it's great uh, in, in the chat, uh, Tim is talking about, you could do this in Photoshop. It's true, you could. You could use uh, a technique we call rotoscoping to make this happen, which is where you go um, frame by frame, uh, is uh, <laughs> you go frame by frame and draw each new iteration, each new frame of that mountain edge uh, or erasing something or however you're going to do it, you could draw it all one frame at a time. However, we were in luck that um, the, the good people at Adobe um, have a way to make the computer do that work. Okay, so the first method I want to talk about is something called the roto brush. Okay, now the roto brush requires you to have a layer of some kind. So I'm just duplicating, I'm duplicating our original uh, footage layer here. So our, our stock clip, I'm duplicating some of that. So first method I wanna show you is the roto brush. Okay, now if you're using After Effects, uh, we are on version, whoop, about After Effects, we're on version 17.1.1, build 34 uh, here. And um, if you were using, say, the, the beta uh, version, the latest beta release, which should be available in everybody's Creative Cloud, I believe, you could be enjoying the new and improved Roto Brush. We're gonna use Roto Brush Classic here. 
Both of them may not be appropriate to this, but we're going to find out. We're going to find out together. Okay, so you will want to double click on your footage, which will open it up in a little, a little footage uh, viewer here. So we were looking at the comp, we've double clicked on the footage, and now we are, we are isolating this layer here, isolating it right here. And you can scrub through the footage as you like, perfectly nice. Um, you can zoom in, you can view uh, various levels of, of layers of things that you've put on it. And we are going to go up here to this. Um, it looks like a man um, being erased uh, with a paintbrush. A very terrifying image. But this is the roto brush. And in fact, it's your friend. So I'm going to click on it. And I get this interesting green circle. Uh, you can, uh, with the green circle, you can click and drag. And that will add uh, to your selection. Right, so we are now adding, uh, we're adding this purple area to our selection. Uh, you can hold down, whoop, ah, no. <laughs> and in drawing, in drawing that selection, you'll notice I've added too much. I've added too much to the selection. It's bled out into this area because After Effects is trying to find things that go together. So let's say I just draw like this. Oh, it's added all of these. Oh, what an interesting choice. Um, how about I add like that? Oh, it's added up there. Uh, add some more of this. Oh, add more of this. Oh, wonderful. So you can see it's trying to spread around into areas. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. If we've added too much, I can hold down the Alt or Option key, which will change it from green to red, make a brush stroke, and it has removed some of the selection. But you'll notice it's not getting it perfectly correct. It's not 100% on a lot of this, so you do have a little bit of refinement that you might need to do. You may need to come in and refine these edges. And in particular with mountainous landscape scene like this, it can be confusing to the program what shapes are which. You know, which, uh, what is this mountain? What is that mountain? Now, the reason why this is confusing to the Roto brush, even though it's powered by fabulous artificial intelligence technology, uh, is that these things are very similar in color. They're very similar in composition, very similar in geometry. So when the Roto brush is going to attempt to propagate new frames for me, it's going to try to do some work for me here which is great. I love it when the computer tries to do work for me. I, you know, I can't stress enough how much I love computer doing work for me. Um, you see this little bar down here. This little bar, I'm gonna just move ahead. I'm gonna move my playhead forward and you see Rotobrush propagating. It's working on it, it's working hard. And now you can see, oh, it's done actually quite a good job. That this purple line is following what's going on, right? It's trying to fill in so I don't have to draw every frame. I wouldn't want to draw every frame. That would be kind of unpleasant. Um, so much drawing. But, 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 the Roto Brush has not done the best job. Honestly, this purple line is going absolutely crazy town. Uh, notice how it's, it's, it's going up, it's going down, it's squiggling all over the place. And that's because the contrast between the element I want to select and the element I want to offset it from, they're, they're too similar, right? Now we could spend some time treating the footage to make the contrast a little bit higher. We could try to visually isolate these things. But in this case, I'm going to rule, for me, the Roto brush might not be the tool for this particular job. And the Roto Rush is fantastic for a lot of things, um, specifically uh, hair and painting uh, human subjects uh, from background uh, elements. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, uh, you know, as it as it improves even greatly, uh, even greater uh, over time, you know, it it uh, it will continue to get become a better tool as well. Not to say the Roto Brush isn't amazing and impressive. This will save you hours of labor on a lot of projects. But just remember, it is only one 
only one of many tools. Uh, and Blair in the chat uh, asking, is this going to be available to watch later? It'll be available for all time. So if you if you need to come back and and rewatch things, um, it'll it'll always be archived on the internet for all time, all space. Uh, so you can you can enjoy all of my all of my oopsies uh, for all time. Hmm. However, however, I just want to run through a little bit more of what the rotor brush is doing and what is happening here. Okay, so the rotor brush here, what it's done is it is actually cutting this uh, mountain out from the background. So all of that uh, selecting um, has helped to refine and define uh, what's going on here. Now, we can, of course, go in here and take our refine edge tool, which will be wonderful. We're going to take this and we're going to say, uh, could you just refine this edge over here, maybe? Could you do a little bit of a better job with this edge? And then we're going to go like this and we'll try to refine it. but. The refining edge is mostly made for soft surfaces, and these are hard surfaces. So that's why things are a little confusing at this moment, and that might not be the tool for us. So what tools are for us? Right? What tools, uh, what else do we have in our, in our toolbox? Well, After Effects is, <laughs> is an entire garage of tools. So let's get into some of these, okay? So let us, uh, let us remove our pre previous attempt uh, at, at rotoing the mountain away. And how can we avoid um, having to do this frame by frame? Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde in the chat says um, that they have spent too many hours of their life rotoscoping frame by frame by frame. Um, and uh, it is true, it is a process. Um, but let's see if we can make this process easier and faster, okay? So we have tracking data from yesterday that we created. Um, so we can add things into the scene. We can add um, all kinds of things into the scene. Now, of course, I have opened the Roto brush, which has now tripped my, tripped my GPU uh, a little bit, but no, here we go. We're good. We've got the, <laughs> we've got the, we've got the targets back. Oh, oh, I was panicked for a moment uh, that I would have to turn it off and on again, but we can now add 3D things into the space. Now, if we could create an object, if we create an object, for example, that is the size, shape, and alignment of sort of the planes out here, right? So mountains, mountains I like to use for this example because we get a lot of kind of planes out in the space. So what do I mean by planes? Well, you can kind of see that this area here is kind of like a triangle, right? This is kind of like a little triangular plane, right? And then uh, over here, this is like another triangular plane, kind of. Now, ho hopefully you can kind of see um, what I'm what I'm referencing here, this area here that you can kind of see in shadow, this facet um, right here, uh, kind of feels like a plane. Um, this here definitely feels like a big a big plane. Like that's all um, that's all very common and contiguous uh, to itself, but it's not exact, right? There's a lot of bumps and jags and outcroppings and all these things. But let's try to get close. Let's try to get close with this, okay? So with our 3D camera tracker selected, here's a method that I like to do. I like to try to add a 3D shape that is close to the area that I'm interested in. So let's say I'm interested in up here. I'm going to go, oh, I'm gonna save early and often, folks. I am going to create a solid. I'd like to create a solid up here. So, you know, this is our, our create solid and camera, but we don't really need that second camera. You know, I appreciate it, but I don't need it. But this solid really looks like it's firmly tracked into the space. Like that solid just belongs when you look at it, right? But I don't want to look at it right now. I'm going to stop looking at it. So I've poked its eye out, so we can't really see it at this moment, okay? Now I'm going to take my pen tool and with this 
layer selected. Remember, this layer lives in 3D space. It looks kind of like this, okay? But I'm gonna poke its eye out so we don't have to see it, but it's still selected. But know that I'm going to draw on it. So if we were looking at it, I could start drawing uh, points on it like this. Boop. And now I've now I've made it uh, look like that shape, okay? But do, 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 do. What I wanna do is poke its eye out so it's not visible, so I can see what I'm gonna be working on. And then I'm going to try my best, I'm gonna really try my best to draw a shape loosely that fits with this particular form, okay? Now you'll notice I'm being a little bit loose with this um, and I'm just trying to gauge Go. Oh, now I'm, you know I'm making more work for myself. The more points you add, the more work you're adding for yourself uh, when it comes to updating these points. Keeping in mind, you can add more detail later if you want to. We can always come back and add more. Okay, and we'll say that it's like that. Okay, so I've drawn this shape, right? Now when I turn this back on, wouldn't you know it, the shape lines up. Even though I was drawing the points in 2D frame relative, they were sticking bloop, 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 to the plane in a 3D way, right? <laughs> oh, Tim, you're always cracking me up in the chat. This is some very edgy stuff. Um, now, as we scrub through, notice that we are pretty close. This is pretty close. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, uh, you know I'm not gonna uh, say it's perfect, but it's pretty close. And when it comes to this kind of work, you want to just make big moves and then refine later, right? So we're gonna make a big move, try to block out as much of this as we can, and then start to refine a little bit at a time. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to go into this mask. I'm going to poke that layer's eye out again so I don't have to look at it. And I'm going to set a keyframe for this mask. And I want to just make sure, I'm going to give this just a little bit, a few little bumps every which way. Oh yes, good, good little bumps. Going through, you can hold down space bar to give yourself the hand tool to pan around as we bump, bump, bump. Little bumps. Okay. Ah, oh, hello. <laughs> hello, Scott. Good to see you in the chat, man. Mm. So, I've made my little bumps. Now I'm going to scrub through on the timeline. And I'm looking for what I would call a point of maximum displacement. <laughs> Those are my big words for the day. But basically, I'm looking for when am I furthest away from my ideal state, okay? And I think I'm in luck that the start and end, I might only need three keyframes on this thing. So I'm gonna go to the start here where all of the points, as you can see, are, they're a little bit maligned at this point. So I'm just gonna grab the points and try to align them a little bit. And doing so sets a keyframe, right? Sets a keyframe for the shape. And I'm just kind of going through and I'm lightly clicking and brushing these points around trying to brush these onto the right onto the right area clicking and dragging and now i'm going to scrub through pretty good not it's not again it's not perfect but it's pretty good right now let me go to the end here this other point of maximum displacement right i'm furthest away from my goal oh very far right here oh my goodness so i'm going to drag those points in Dragging them in, drag, 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 dragging these points in. And look here, like these, these points are a little bit far off. We might need to do a lot more refinement uh, to the shape uh, momentarily, but let's just try to get it close for now. Let's get it close for now and then deal with the little outliers later, okay? And keep in mind, we are quite zoomed in here, right? We're at like 800% zoomed in. So when we zoom back out, these won't be as noticeable. So we've got three keyframes. Let's scrub through and see how we feel about how well that line sticks 
to the line we want, I want to look through for, again, a point of maximum displacement, where am I furthest from my goal? And then I want to go zoom in, find those areas and refine them. Come in and push, refine, refine, pushing, pushing. And this is quite a bit easier because, because we have set for ourselves this layer in 3D space that in general, its position and movement is correct. So we don't have as much work to do because a lot of the big movement problems have already been taken care of. Now, of course, I've, I've missed some points, right? Wow, Evan, you've missed some points here. Um, well, let, let me see if I can refine some of those, right? So what you can do is I'm starting to see that there's a dent in here, big old dent. And so I'm going to take my pen tool and I'm going to add a point uh, probably on one of the keyframes. I'm going to add, ooh, make sure your, your cursor goes to the plus sign, click and add it. And what's really great about that is that it has added this new point to all the other keyframes, right? And so if that's something that kind of disappears over time, it just fades back into the mix, right? If you want to move between keyframes, you could use the J and the K um, points on your keyboard, or keys on your keyboard, rather. So I'm going to tab through here, and I need to add uh, another little dent uh, in here. Boop, adding a dent. Now I'm going to hit J to go back to this one and just make sure that, that that dent is aligned to where I think it should be. Okay, good. And then we go here. Oh, okay. How is that? Doo -doo, doo -doo. Now I want to scrub through and just to double check. Yeah, that looks fine. Looks fine to me. Trying to find areas where perhaps there are these dents are out of control, but that looks pretty fine to me. And wouldn't you know it, with four little keyframes and a 3D layer, we have we've got a little mat that fits. So we've done this little plane here. Now I know what you're saying, Evan, that's not the entire mountain. Come on, man. We, uh, I'd have to do so many other planes and facets. Yes, you would. And with this method, you want to create more little shapes that perhaps behave independently of each other. However, when you combine them all together, will make your final form. Okay? Because we're dealing with different planes and different facets of this, you, you'll end up with a bunch of um, triangles and, and squares and shapes all over the place that align with the various edges that you're interested in. So notice I'm only interested in the edges at this point, okay? And that's because those are the areas of detail that we're going to notice the most, okay? Now, something else that I will notice is that we are so far away here, right? That this border is is a little bit um <laughs> it's a little bit it's a little bit blurry, right? Like it's not perfectly sharp out here. So to that end, I would take this layer and I would probably add I want to say either a a a gauze Gaussian 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 blur. I've never learned how to pronounce uh, words uh, ever. Um, so this blur, the G blur, um, which I enjoy these days because it is GPU accelerated, which means if you have powerful GPUs you can leverage, this will behave uh, very nice for you. Or if you're not super concerned about the quality of the blur, I would actually recommend you use some of your fast blur options, like the fast box blur, perhaps. That might be the way to go. So the fast box blur allows us to have a blur radius and then a number of iterations. So we can really dial in sort of the quality uh, that we want here. Ooh, sorry, I just looked at the chat and I saw someone was talking about dragons. Uh, <laughs> so very, very interested. Uh, so as you can see, I can blur it out. So the blurriness seems to match a little bit. You want the blurriness to be very similar. 
okay? If you, if you can help it. Um, and with that in mind, we know that this layer probably isn't going to be enough for our Yeti, right? But we can now use this layer to help us build what we call a mat, a mat to, to uh, uh, that's mat with two T's and an E, okay? So mats are very important when it comes to compositing. Um, oh, Anthony Brown is asking, would a mask feather work as well? Absolutely. So there are, <laughs> the promise with After Effects is there are three ways to do just about anything. And, uh, and this is, uh, this is one of them. So like you said, if you want to use the mask feather, we can feather your mask out, <laughs> feather, 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 just like that. Um, what's, what's really nice about the feather is that we can feather it down and then we can expand it out, out and in if you would like. So we can, we can like feather it by two pixels and then push it, push it in or push it out. Um, you know, in either direction. So if you are comfortable with masks, that's a great way to do it. Um, I did want to speak to um, uh, masks just, uh, just a little bit more in a moment. Uh, but for now, I want to show you how this would be used to remove some of a layer, okay? So, okay, let me clear away. Let me just go ahead and take all of these, I mean, they're all wonderful things, uh, but I'm gonna make them shy layers uh, for now, just because they're cluttering up, they're cluttering up the timeline. I don't need to see those. We don't need to see those. So we're just down to what I'm gonna call the cliff edge, right? So we've got this cliff edge here. And if we want the cliff edge to help block out our Yeti, let's get a Yeti in here. Wow, it's me, the Yeti. Here's our smiling Yeti. What a wonderful, wonderful man. Is he? I don't know. We, we, we do not know uh, the, the, the specific uh, gender of the Yeti. So we're going to bring the Yeti in. We're going to rotate him around. And right now he's a two-dimensional layer, right? That's not, uh, that's not what we want from this. We want him to live in the scene. I've decided in my mind that this Yeti is a, is a boy Yeti. Um, and I'm going to make him 3D. Click. Oh, oh, he's moved. Oh, this, uh, ah, ugh, ugh. Whenever you make a layer 3D, it now has to behave in the 3D space with the rules of the 3D world, right? So this happens to be where this position is in the world. But I would like him to live behind the cliff, right? So what's the easiest way to do that? Well, I know that this happens to live on the cliff. So I'm going to take the Yeti and I'm going to put them on the cliff, holding down shift parenting to the cliff edge. Oh, look at that. Now he's stuck. <laughs> he's stuck exactly on the cliff edge, like a big sticker that we've put on there. Okay. Now we don't need to leave him parented to that. I was really only using that to get him into position. Okay. So now I'm going to make him an orphan. I'm going to, I'm going to remove, he's no longer interested in hanging out with his mom and dad. Uh, they've all grown up. They're going to define their lives for themselves. So they are no longer, I'm, I'm removing that parenting link. Okay. Now I'm going to call up the rotation. I'm going to call up the position and I'm going to, um, use these here. I'm just going to go reset to those values and <laughs> yeah, that looks like a Yeti snowboard. Uh, so now I'm going to take their position on the Z axis. I'm going to push them back in space. Now you can see this line here, how it kind of cuts into the Yeti as these two planes intersect. Once he is free of that plane, we can assume, we can assume that it has moved beyond that space. It's moved far enough back. Uh, I might move him back just a little bit further. And then I'm going to move him over a little bit like this. And now I'm going to um, hit W to call it my rotation. I'm going to rotate him a little bit like this. So he's at a funny jaunty angle. Maybe I'll rotate him a little bit this way, maybe a little bit just like so. 
And now we can kind of see boop, as he pops his head uh, into frame. So it kind of looks like he's wearing a, a weird scarf at this point. Okay. But that's how much of the Yeti I need to cut away. Now, how will I remove this much of the Yeti? Oh, that sounds more sinister than I was hoping. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to now... You may have to do this on yours, but your interface may look different. I have to toggle my switches and modes so that the tr Turk mat, track mat here, <laughs> the track mat options become available. Now the track mat options are very, very useful things, um, especially when it comes to making things appear or disappear or hide behind things. It's a classic, classic method coming up here. Now. With the Yeti selected, I'm going to go to their track mat, and I'm going to choose Alpha Inverted Mat Cliff Edge. Now, track mats, if you haven't used them before, are a layer looking at the layer above it and asking it, Dear, dearest layer, what, a, what about me should be seen? And then the layer above will will look down uh, to the look down to the layer below, and will explain to it. Well, please just look at my alpha information, and uh, be wherever that is, or be wherever that isn't. Okay. So when I say alpha information, I'm going to solo this layer, and I'm going to look at only the alpha channels. Okay. So that's what this little toggle is here. Show alpha channel. So we can see that. The alpha channels of this layer, it is visible here and it is invisible here. That's what the alpha information is. Okay. We're going to return to RGB. We're going to return to seeing all the layers. So if I were to say Yeti, please use the alpha inverted of the layer above you. Boop. That means that it's going to look at that layer and it's going to be everywhere that it isn't, right? So that's why it's now cut this shape out of the Yeti, right? And so if we observe the Yeti, actually looks pretty good. <laughs> this actually looks pretty good. Oh, hello, hello, RB. Welcome to the, welcome to the chat. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming out. Um, if you ever have any questions, like I said, uh, do let us know. We're at about the halfway point here of the stream. If you've missed anything, you can always watch the replay. And if you're observing this on YouTube, then please, I would love to see your chat. I'd love to see your questions. Come join us on, on behance.net slash live. Uh, cause uh, if you, if you're having troubles with anything we're talking about, I'd love to help you out. So as you can see now, this guy is visible like this. Now we could have said, uh, alpha mat of the cliff. Now that means that we'll only be able to see the Yeti in that space, in that window, right? So that is what we're doing here. That, that the track mat is explaining where we are going to see this, okay? So, 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 so. We now have the rest of the Yeti <laughs> hanging out in an unpleasant space. You know, I don't want to see this much of the Yeti. So we can apply a mask to this Yeti to cover up the rest of the space or to choose which parts we want to see, all right? So I've just drawn a mask on the Yeti layer, right? To only look at the top of the Yeti. And uh, that's actually worked out pretty well. Hello, <laughs> and it just kind of shows up. Isn't that working out great? It's working out great for me. Now. You can, in some instances, simply use a mask on the layer to, sh to hide or reveal, right? So instead of going through all of this uh, cliff edge rigmarole, you know, we could have just created a mask on this layer and attempted to move and massage all of the points to be exactly this line um, as it changes. But you're guaranteed that that's going to change every frame. That's going to be very difficult. But sometimes that is necessary. We may have to keyframe this uh, line depending. But what's really great about this is that this cliff edge does live here. It does live there. So if I choose to manipulate the Yeti around, if I say like, oh, Yeti too big, I make, I make the Yeti smaller, right? The Yeti is independent of the cliff. 
So I'm able to shift and manipulate the Yeti around independent of the cliff, you know, as much as I'd like. And, and it, it just works, right? Because it lives here. So with 3D layers, we're creating elements that live in the space and interact in the 3D environment, right? In a way that makes it simpler for us to deal with them. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, what if, what if, for example, we went through all of the trouble to get all of the little edges of this entire thing, right? Let's do, let's do another edge. Cause I know there are people who are, are coming in halfway and uh, we should, we should show them. Oh. Oh, sorry. I needed some refreshing tea for my, <laughs> my pained throat. We should show people how, how did we do this? Well, I'll try to take you through the process pretty quickly and succinctly. Let's pick another edge. Um, that we want to have something show up on. How about this edge up here? Okay, so as I said, we're going to grab some points and then we are going to right click. We're going to create a solid and a camera. We don't really need that extra camera. We can delete it. Hopefully this lines up very well. And in particular, we want a little bit of overlap between these two uh, edges, right? We want the two of these things to overlap a little bit so that there's no gap between them. There might be a gap and we'll try to smooth that. But remember, we've created something for this cliff edge. Let's call this the slope face. And now, is that a slope? Um, what do you call that? I think it has a specific mountain name. We'll figure it out. So, someone who is an alpinist, let me know. But we have this slope. We are going to poke its eye out so we don't see it. And then we are going to attempt to draw in the space. Now, instead of poking the eye out, you might instead say, well, I still want to see it. So you can dial down the opacity so that it's really faint out here. And now I'm just going to take my pen tool and I'm going to draw. <laughs> Make sure you have the layer selected first. And then I'm going to draw this edge. Ooh. Now remember what I said before that I'm just drawing generally, right? I'm not drawing uh, as specifically. Um, and in fact, I don't necessarily care about the bottom points. We're just gonna do like that. All right, let's dial that opacity back up so you can kind of see what we got here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna go ahead and poke its eye out and we're gonna go into the mask. We're gonna update this mask color oh, to be something bright so that we can actually see it stand out from the background, I think. Like, what good, what good is a mask color if I can't really see it, right? Okay, good. So we've got this. And now we want to take the mask, we want to keyframe the mask path, and we want to find points where this mask is no longer relevant. <laughs> And as you can see, I've done a classic oopsie. I confused myself. I thought that these points here were part of it, but they're definitely not. <laughs> oh, silly me. That was the back mountain, not the foreground mountain. Okay, here we go. So now we're scrubbing through, and it looks like this is actually the point of maximum displacement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to adjust the points here like so. Now, when I say the point of maximum displacement, I mean the frame at which it is most different, right? The frame at which it is most different. And now we're going to scrub through, maybe, maybe just hang out in the middle here. Let's have a look at, at what's going on at two seconds. Oh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde is asking, how do I change this mask color? Well, next to the name of the mask, you see a little box. You see this little box here? Give that little box a click and you can change it to whatever color your heart desires um, or hearts desire, uh, depending on how many hearts you have in your body. Um, and there we go. So now I'm just going through and I'm trying to set as few keyframes as possible. I'm trying to be very lazy. Um, I will admit this 
only to you on this stream, um, because I know we're friends um, and you won't tell anybody, but I'm a very lazy person. Um, I try to do as little work as possible um, whenever possible. And part of that is trying to get away with using the fewest points and keyframes on these things as I can. Um, also, I try to avoid using tangents uh, if I can, instead opting to smooth this out using feathers, using effects, using mats, um, trying to make this uh, as pain-free as possible. So let's see, let's see, have I done a very good job of it? Um, perhaps, let's see, we might need to adjust a little bit in here. <laughs> oh, Tim, I, li I like your attitude. My secrets are safe as long as no one has, has an interest in revealing them. Um, okay, so now I've created a second shape, and I think that's going to be good enough. We could spend forever refining and making it absolutely perfect, right? And these two kind of overlap a little bit, okay? So we've got these two elements, right? And if I wanted the Yeti here to pop up and then i don't know maybe um maybe his position will simply change he'll go from over there doo -doo 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 -doo, to over here push him back a little bit in space to be back here maybe i'll change his rotation a little bit let me change his z rotation um to stand up a little bit maybe he's he's trying to go to his summer cottage um, let's keep pushing him back like so along the cliff. So he's going to be moving, right? So I've set these keyframes for him to go wee like this, which is nice. I'm going to eat, I'm going to ease these keyframes. So I'm going to grab the keyframes, I'm going to hit F9. Um, I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to, I'm in the graph editor and I'm just going to squeeze the handles a little bit. So he's going to pop on, and then he's going to move up like that. Well, I need the Yeti to be referencing both of these as, uh, as its mat. But you can only have one track mat. Only one track mat allowed, please. Um, and so, how do we accomplish that? Also, there's this little gap in here, and that's nasty too. So, how are we going to fix this up? Okay. Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what I'm going to do. I am going to first duplicate the stock footage. I'm going to duplicate the camera, right? I'm going to duplicate those. Command D is what I pressed. Then I'm going to place those up here. And these are going to be composed. They're going to be pre-composed. For me, it's Command Shift C. And this is going to be the mountain face mat. Okay. And we're moving all the compositions in here. We're adjusting the duration, but we really don't have to. And let's open it up. Okay. Now we hit okay on that. We've created a composition that only holds these things. Okay. This layer here, I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to go down and I'm going to say, make it a guide layer. Now guide layers are not observed in other comps. Oop, don't need that. We are summer cottage plus Yeti. Yeah, that's what we are. So even though, even though the mountain face mat, even though the mountain face mat has this footage in it and it has this camera so that the camera movement in here is the same between the two comps, exactly the same. And it has these, the only layers we see are these two. Okay. Because we've made this one a guide layer, right? So that's all we see in here. Okay, so now this is what we have. We basically have this weird neon <laughs> shape of the mountain uh, on this layer, right? But now the Yeti can use that as its alpha inverted uh, situation, right? Hello! Oh, now I'm going up here. The, and we've crafted this, we've, crea we've crafted this out of these two... Um, these two shapes, right? That are disparate 3D shapes, but they form one, um, 
one sort of positive space, or, or in this case, a negative space, right? So they create one space out of the two things, okay? Now, let's go back into here and see this little triangular area here? I'm going to now add a two-dimensional shape to this space, okay? So I'm going to do this by going layer, new, and I'm going to create a new, what do I want? I would like a new mm, solid. Oh, there it is. Create a new solid, make it the comp size, hit OK. All right, now I shouldn't have made a black solid. Let me, let me go back. Layer, new, solid. And instead of a black solid, I don't know, let's make it just a bright yellow. Beam. Sorry about that. Poke its eye out. And I'm going to take my pen tool. And as you know, when this is selected, we can take our pen tool, we can draw on it. And we're going to draw something that is roughly inside these two shapes. Okay? Just roughly. Doesn't have to be even close to good. It can be quite bad. This is just here to take up space, um, like I do at meetings. Um, so this thing is taking up space, and it's I'm making sure that it overlaps here. Okay. Now this path we may have to um, keyframe its mask path quite a bit. We're going to find out. So again, we're going to scrub to a point of maximum displacement. And again, just adjusting our points very crudely. Not super interested in being great at this. Um, we're just moving them around. Don't worry about this little intersection. That doesn't mean anything to us. Um, and we're just going scrubbing through, making sure that it takes up space, right? Um, is it easy to expand that mask over the Yeti? Oh, interesting question, Steve. Um, so Steve, when you're, when you're talking about expanding the mask over the Yeti to cover up the one bottom bit that's peeking out. Yes. So that's kind of what we're doing here is that we are expanding this mask so that it covers up the area, this area that is left behind, right? So that it's really just doing a janky job of covering that up. And it doesn't have to be great, right? It doesn't have to be very good um, because the only thing that is delicate and precious about this situation is this line here, the line formed by the edges, the details that we want to preserve. This is just trash. This is garbage. Um, and its only job is to not disrupt that beautiful edge uh, that we have spent uh, all of 45 minutes crafting. <laughs> but as you can see, it takes a few tweaks. Oh, 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 it's getting away from me. What was that? What was that? Uh, there we go. A little scrubbing through. Some tight camera changes. Now, you might do this with a 3D layer. You might do this with all kinds of things. However you create this trash shape is up to you. I'm, I don't know why I'm being so disrespectful to this, this shape, but... Um, so we have done it. Congratulations, we've created that. Now here's what's important, right? Remember we talked about the alpha channel? That's all we're interested in, is creating this alpha shape, right? That's really all we're doing. Um, and Robert is asking, couldn't you just add to the existing edge mat, add points? So Robert, one of the reasons that I wouldn't want to do that is because I have placed keyframes and although I didn't place very many keyframes, I couldn't just draw sort of the one shape. I'd have to keep refining it. Now, in larger projects or things that have more delicate changes, I might end up with like 50 to 100 little points, right? And then if I come back and try to add this thing, which honestly requires more gross movement, um, it can be difficult to add back in points and then keep changing them over and over again. By working in segmented lumps, right, by creating separate layers that do their own job, we're able to compartmentalize our labor and we are able to sort of be a lot looser and more gestural uh, in our work. Um, and it hmm, works out pretty well. Um, 
Oh, what was that other thing we needed to do? We needed to perhaps feather this one a little bit. So I'm going to give it a little bit of feather on that edge. And we're good to go. So hopefully that hopefully that makes sense for why we would use multiple layers rather than um, simply expanding these existing masks with their existing uh, points, right? Now, granted, I've had to make quite a number of these little keyframes, but it didn't take very long. And those are all a lot of little gross alterations. <laughs> so gross. But hey, let's get back to this this fine fella up here. How's he doing? Hello. And then he's coming up there. I think that's working out pretty well, right? Um, Anthony's asking, does that new mat comp need collapse transformations turned on? Good question, Anthony. In this case, it does not. Now, the reason it does not, I'll just <laughs> go in here, and uh, uh, the reason it does not is because this layer has its own camera inside of it that is moving in the exact same way as the camera out here. So the two comps are kind of a matched set, right? That They both happen to be moving in the same way, right? They're both doing the exact same thing. Now we could avoid the need to have a camera in here, right? So I'm gonna turn this camera off. Things get a little bit weird in here. Now everything's broken out here. But if I went ahead and I said, collapse transformations, we're back, right? We're back because the collapse transformation is now pulling all that 3D information. And it's preserving that 2D information um, in this space. So it's pulling it in here. So you have to decide if you wanna do either of those two options. You can either um, collapse the transformations or you can bring a camera with you. So. I, for whatever reason, often prefer to bring the camera with me. Uh, you may find it more flexible to collapse the transformations, um, if only because that'll allow you, if you want to do things like turn on depth of field and other more sort of advanced things, um, that's when you might do one or the other. So again, subjective choice, totally up to, to, to you if it, if it makes more sense to do one than the other. But with collapse transformations, uh, we now get to enjoy the 3D information pulled into this space, or we can uh, or we can push the camera into that comp. So it's got to be one or the other. Um, both are valid and good. Um, let's see. Let's see. So I think we've done a fairly good job of making this happen. We uh, good. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that helps uh, Anthony Brown. That's fantastic. Oh, I, I love. I love it when I. When I knock these questions out of the park. Uh, da, da, da. So, I'd like to talk about a few other things while we are here. Mm -hmm. Things that I think are fairly important and I hope will help you with your compositing. So we've talked about a few techniques here. We've talked about rotobrush. We've talked about rotoscoping. We've, we've tried to help you avoid rotoscoping as much as possible. We've talked about integrating 3D layers and 2D layers to create these mats. I would like now to talk about some other 2D layer integrations that might be useful to you. So we were, we were able to get a very good 3D camera solve here and we're able to drop things into this space because this mountain that we're trying to put the mats on is geometry that doesn't move, right? So the camera is moving in the scene, but this mountain's not going anywhere, right? This isn't some avatar style earth bending. We're not gonna move this mountain anywhere or um, uh, NK Jemison's uh, The Fifth Season. No one's shifting these mountains. Um, great book, by the way. Um, so that's why we're able to get away with this methodology. Now, if, for example, there were some things moving in the scene, let's say there was uh, like a little skier going down the hill or something like that, and we needed to track them. We needed to have something stick on that fella as they go, as they go down the hill, okay? How would we achieve that kind of a thing? 
how would we track something two dimensionally? Well, we could go window tracker and we, we get our tracker on the phone um, and uh, we would want to um, hit this little track motion button. So this is going to give us 2D tracking information. Now, 2D tracking information allows us to place things in two dimensions relative to the frame, okay? So, and those things can have the appearance sometimes of being three-dimensional, all right? So, for example, let's track, where's a nice little example that we can grab? This. So this is a nice little high contrast bit of pixels uh, down here. So I am going to first clip this uh, layer so that I don't have to think about it too much. And let's try to track this point in two dimensions, just in case we wanted to stick something on it. I don't know, maybe we do. And I'm gonna go track motion. And you'll see that it opens up this layer in its own composition. And then we get track point one, okay, that we can now drag around. All right, so track point one, dragging around. You, you'll see that it has a little zoom, uh, zooms in a little bit when we do this. And it's also kind of blurry when we do that. Okay, so let's call up the options for that. Whoop, bring this over. And we are going to be tracking based on the luminance, how bright or dark pixels are compared to each other. Uh, we can get the sub pixel tracking, that works fine. And this question here is the one that kind of throws people. If your confidence is below 80%. So if the tracker uh, loses its confidence out there, if it if it becomes um, dissuaded, uh, if it gets enough rejection, if its confidence is reduced below 80%, we can ask it to do things. And I'm going to say it should uh, stop tracking. As it should just pause. You know, if you don't have the confidence to continue, you should pause. So that's, those are the instructions we can give to the tracker. Um, you can choose to differentiate pixels based on their color, their luminance, or how uh, saturated they are. So we have all these choices. Luminance, I think, works best for us because we're really only deciding between what is what are dark pixels and light pixels here. Now, this is where the UI gets a little bit funny. The inner box is what I'm interested in tracking, okay? And the outer box is where I'm interested in searching for it. I hope that makes sense. So I'm looking for this in this, okay? And then I'm just gonna say, analyze forward. And it looks like it's doing a very good job. It's not stopping, it's confidence seems very high. What a confident machine. Um, and so now we can scrub through, we can see how well uh, uh, the program did with that. And it looks like it's locked right on there. Okay, I'm gonna make a new null object. Okay, excellent, excellent null. And then I'm gonna go down here on the tracker panel, I'm gonna go edit target. And then I'm going to choose which layer to stick the motion on. I'm gonna to choose to stick it on null four. I'm gonna hit okay. And then I'm gonna hit apply. Okay, now we're gonna notice Oh, here we go. Oh, sorry. I'm get this dialogue up. Apply it to the X and Y dimensions. Yes, please. And now you can see that this uh, null here is covered in keyframes. Whoa, what's up with all those keyframes, buddy? Um, and uh, that's how uh, that's how that stuff uh, kind of works out. <laughs> oh, and Sam, thank you for for plugging uh, plugging the the Evan Abrams website. The website is pretty, pretty uh, error prone at the moment. Uh, you can also check out uh, E.C. Abrams anywhere on the internet, anytime you like. Find me on Twitter, Instagram. I'm all over the place. But uh, for now, let's continue with this null that we have tracked into the space. Now, we've got 3D things, 3D person over here, 3D Yeti, um, 3D layers. This 2D layer, how would we make use of that? Well... This allows us to stick things two-dimensionally into the space. Now, 
There may be many reasons why you would want to do this, but chief among them is that we simply cannot get a hold of something um, in 3D. Like I said, if this was a skier going down the mountain, if this were uh, a helicopter flying through the canyon, um, whatever the point, the two-dimensional point is, it can be hard to both solve the scene to create a consistent 3D environment and to track things in it. So these are the two things we talked about yesterday, tracking and solving. So this is how you would track something in the scene. And I'm going to just grab, I'm going to duplicate the cottage call out and I'm going to call this um, another call out. I don't know, what could that little thing be? Um, picnic location? I don't know. But this is going to be here on this another call out. I'm going to remove the 3D information from these layers. Whoop. And I am going to go in here. Oh, why am I so bad at typing today? Call out exclamation point. I'm going to refine uh, some of this stuff here. Sort of bring the size down uh, like so. Does that animation still make sense? Not really. Uh, we'll, we'll tighten that up. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Up over. Oh boy. That feels way too fast now. <laughs> oh yeah, there, he, he is your problem. All right, I just need to touch up the percentages a little bit. Oh, that one still remains very relevant. Good. Okay. I'm going to touch this up to make sure that it actually connects. Like so. Good. I'm going to take all these. We're going to set them to normal. Good. Like that. So, this another callout we can take drop into our scene and we can parent again holding down shift parenting it to that null down there we're going to need to change the anchor point so we can change the anchor point in multiple ways i like to just dial it in over here after i've parented it to things like so and now i'm going to take this and i'm going to scale it down a little bit so it's like that and now you can see, thanks to our two-dimensional tracking, that callout kind of lives down there on the slope, right? So we have multiple things tracked into the space here, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Robert Denver is uh, suggesting it is a cottage garden. Hmm, perhaps. <laughs> a little little snow garden where you can acquire snow melons, perhaps? I'm not really sure. Um, but here's that's how we would insert something two-dimensionally into the space. Notice it doesn't necessarily deform in the same way as our as our camera angle changes, right? So it does look a little bit strange, but that's another way that you can insert your motion graphics into a scene, right? Two-dimensionally. And to have it sort of live there a little bit. If we uh, if we need to like uh, to follow the path of someone in a 3D context, then we're getting way more advanced than we want to handle for the getting started. Uh, portion of these programs. So hopefully this starts to make a lot of sense. Have a look at my checklist over here, make sure that we're, we're hitting all the things. Um, yes, yes, yes. So before we move on, uh, I just want to really quickly talk about some things that we touched on yesterday as I unshy 
a bunch of these layers here. Um, these ones we don't really need, um, but this adjustment layer we do need. So, boop. I've put I put an adjustment layer yesterday over top of all of the layers, right? That it lives above all the layers and then applies, you know, our in this case our lumetry color to everything below it, right? Now when we're doing effects and such, you have to decide whether you want them to feel integrated. Motion design pieces don't always have to feel integrated. They can often feel extra or super real, right? That we might want to integrate them. And in order to do that, a nice way to do that is to put a lumetry color or various color corrections like curves and, and tints and levels and, and all these things above all of the layers so that everything is getting applied to it, this shift, these shifts in hues, saturations, values, um, so that everything is getting exposed to the same adjustments, right? So that means, for example, we know that the snow is white. We know that the mouth of the Yeti is white. And since the lumetry color is affecting all the whites in all of the scene, then that's getting treated as well. You know, all of the all of the dark shadow areas in the scene, those are being affected as well. So it helps to harmonize by putting this adjustment layer over top of everything, right? Just a little final detail, okay? Another little detail I wanna talk about is that depending on the focal depth of your scene, now, focal depth is sort of this idea that objects in the background are blurrier perhaps than the objects in the foreground, right? That something that is far away is blurry and indistinct, um, like uh, the shelf back there is kind of blurry and indistinct. Um, but things here in the focal plane are, are nice and crisp, like my very crisp glasses, right? And if I were to move closer to the focal plane, my hand is now blurry, right? That makes sense. And it's the same with this footage, even though uh, a lot of it is in, is in very good focus here. Um, but thinking about if your elements should be a little bit blurred, right? Should they be a little bit blurred? And there are two ways we might accomplish this, okay? The first is that with your 3D camera tracker, camera, the one generated by the 3D camera tracker, you might turn on enabling depth of field. Doing so will make your compositions render quite a bit slower, but uh, let's see, let's see if we are, yeah, you can kind of see the difference that it makes. So here it is with it on, and you can, I hope, appreciate uh, the little blurriness of, of Yeti here. Now I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna take depth of field off. Look how crisp, <laughs> look how crispy Mr. Yeti got, right? So going in here, turning on, enabling the depth of field is gonna help with our integration of the graphics into the space by simulating how blurry they would be at that distance based on the camera's information here that we assume has been extracted very well. Now you might need to adjust and refine it a little bit, but overall, this looks very nicely integrated. Like I said, though, it, that can be intense. That can be intense on your system. So another thing you might do, though, instead is to simply take these comps and apply um, a lens lens blur to them. I have many, many blurs, um, but you could generate a, a lens blur. So a camera lens blur is probably what you're looking after. So the, the camera lens blur, you could then apply to the Yeti here and just blur them out, but make sure that if something is on the same plane, or it's supposed to be on the same plane, that you're blurring them to a similar level. So if we're gonna apply the lens blur to the Yeti, we should also apply it to the mat as well. And as you can see, that requires some refinement. So I'm gonna bring this down to like a two, and we're gonna to try to get this edge. Ooh, maybe it's more like a one. Oh, 
Look at that. Look at that. Nice refined edge. That seems to fit. So for Mr. Yeti, we're going to put you down at a one also. Right. So it really depends. You might need to sort of massage such numbers. It really depends on the kind of reality of the scene you're interested in showing. So if you want your stuff to blend, there we go. And Robert Denmers is asking about, how about some motion blur? That's right, Denmers. <laughs> you can see the future as well, that motion blur is another critical element of making these things kind of fit. So here, let me remove these blurs. Let me remove this blur. And let us add a motion blur in here. Now, motion blur, if you're going to turn it on, right? Just remember, if you've collapsed your transformations, then that's where you need to apply your motion blur. So here's for this Yeti, let's give him a little motion blur. Let's try to find where he's moving kind of quickly, make sure it's on for the comp as well. He's, he's not really moving super fast to, to trigger much motion blur happening. Let me just really quickly go into the advanced here. Let's set the shutter angle up to 180. Well, I must have <laughs> messed that up at one point. I'm gonna hit okay, so there we go. Now this is where knowing the shutter angle of the camera and the actual footage would help you out because you wanna make sure that the motion blur of your elements and the motion blur of your footage align with each other. So being able to know, um, we will need to, we would need to pull that or try to get it close, right? That if when we are orbiting around things, if the mountain's not getting blurry, this guy shouldn't be getting blurry either. So make sure that those are harmonized uh, elements. Also, this guy is huge. Um, so even though he's moving fast, maybe he shouldn't be that blurry. But like I said, make sure that you turn on the motion blur for the mat as well. That's gonna be pretty critical. So if you happen to be using um, the collapse transformation option or the camera option, just make sure that, you know, if your mat is overly crisp because, um, because you don't have motion blur turned on, it will look strange, right? That everything's blurry, but the mat, but the boundary between two things, you know, that boundary is not, um, is not blurry, then that would be a little bit strange. Um, However, we're coming into the end of it, folks. So I hope this has been good. I hope this has been useful for you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning this stuff. If you were coming in late to the program, hey, it's going to be available on Behance for all time and all space. And this is just the start uh, of a wonderful, uh, a wonderful day of, uh, of things to come here on Adobe Live. Um, and uh, Bretta uh, is asking, what's my favorite thing about Adobe? Well, one of my favorite things about it uh, personally is is the amount of support uh, that the team gives to their software and to the people who use it. Um, I, don't, I don't. It has. Um, I don't know. Creative Cloud has expanded my creativity into areas that I otherwise wouldn't have gone into. Uh, so, like, I'm I'm doing a lot of things like podcasting and editing, and I mean, I'm a, I'm a motion designer, but having access to the entire suite expands in in so many ways um if you'd like to find more about me on the internet i'm at ec abrams on all the places uh at ec abrams on twitter on instagram on youtube where uh youtube is probably where you'll see me the most where i am teaching a lot about after effects so if you want to learn more of the stuff head on over there however there's more things to do here on adobe live here on behance.net slash live so please Hang out for the rest of the day. Uh, have a great time uh, uh, with us as, as there is more illustration coming up. There are daily challenges. There are portfolio reviews. Make sure you get you get into this stuff and, uh, and, and hang out with us here if you can. That's going to be it for me. Thank you all for, for coming and, and being with me. It's so much fun. It's more fun when you're here. And uh, I hope I see you all uh, next time and down the road. So bye for now. Have a great day and uh, stay creative. Press the out button here. <laughs>